Hey all you neurohackers out there, welcome to Tech for Psych where we combine the latest in neurotechnology with ancient wisdom to supercharge your brain. I'm Dr. Cody Rawl, your medical doctor, confidant, and scientific advisor. Today we're talking about neurofeedback in general. People often ask, what is neurofeedback? What is the evidence behind it? Is it traditional medicine? Is it complementary medicine? Is it alternative medicine? What is neurofeedback? And I've got the Muse headband with me right now, and this is a form of neurofeedback. This is actually a quite recent form of neurofeedback in the form of mobile neurofeedback. So old neurofeedback machines uh, had to do with just old EEG machines. And EEG, of course, is the signal from your brain, the electrical encephalography activity. It's basically when your brain does something that fires a bunch of neurons that creates electrical activity and you can pick that up through sensors that are on your scalp that gets taken into the machine reported back in the form of brain waves and you can actually use that to do something called neurofeedback meaning that uh, you can train someone to control their own brain waves through something called operant conditioning uh, traditional neurofeedback used machines that were uh, tens of thousands of dollars so you would have to go into a clinic and uh, do neurofeedback training with a therapist. But now neurofeedback is available with the Muse headband. Uh, there's a new company called MindLift that offers an additional electrode so you can plop that on the top of your head there and use it for attention training. So I wanted to break down what is complementary and alternative medicine. So uh, if you take traditional medicine in the Western sense where you have doctors in their white coats, they have their medical doctorate degree like I have, uh, or they have a uh, doctor of osteopathy degree. Uh, it's very standardized, very rigidized. You have uh, insurance companies paying for treatments. Like how, how does all this come into neurofeedback? Where does all this come from? And I was thinking about this and it came to my mind that there's really like kind of three main categories that come into play when you make something like, this is a medicine that is, a so, that is approved by the American uh, Medical Association. Like three things that will like definitely make a treatment uh, ushered into that umbrella where insurance companies will pay for it and medical doctors will vet for it. So those three categories are scientific evidence, of course, and the gold standard of scientific evidence is the randomized controlled trial. So you have a treatment group and you have a control group and the treatment group gets the treatment and the control group does not get the treatment and you see if the treatment group did better than the control group. And sort of a classic example of that would be an antibiotic medicine. So uh, people get an infection and uh, the people that get the medicine, does it actually improve the infection or not? Okay. So that's like the prototypical scientific component of it. So that's category one. Category two is, is the treatment important in an emergency situation? So a really bad infection can definitely be in an emergency. So you need that medicine so you can employ it in an emergency situation. And number three, can it be commoditized? Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, our Western medicine culture is very much wrapped up into our uh, belief in capitalism. And I'm not saying capitalism is bad or good. I'm actually quite more towards the side of capitalism being good because it determines the market value of something uh, in human systems, but that's a completely different story that I won't go down that rabbit hole. But if a medicine or a treatment meets those three criteria, three criteria meaning that it's scientifically validated, uh, that it's good in emergency situations and it can be commoditized, man, yeah, insurance companies, medical doctors, they're all over it. You know, that's gonna be something that's going to be brought into the toolkit of what you actually go see a medical doctor for in today's Western medicine. Um, the sad thing is, is that that's not always best for people. That's not always best for the patient, right? So I think diabetes is like a perfect example where uh, diabetes type two is, uh, typically caused by being overweight. You just eat too much food, you eat too much sugary food. Uh, you're spiking your blood sugar level so high that it damages the cells in your pancreas and in uh, the insulin receptors within your skeletal muscle and other tissues to the point where you can't even handle blood sugar anymore. Uh, your blood sugar is not being regulated properly by your natural endogenous insulin levels, meaning that the blood sugars get so high that it becomes toxic in your bloodstream. You know, I would do uh, rotations as a medical student in endocrinology clinics and literally see people's feet falling off. And that's because they didn't exercise, they didn't eat properly, 
uh, their blood sugar levels get out of control. The insulin isn't even really controlling it very well anymore. Uh, they get damaged to the microvasculature in their feet. They accidentally stub their toe. That gets infected because the vas vasculature cannot bring the white blood cells to repair it anymore. And then it gets infected and you even get to the point where people are having to like amputate their legs off, okay? So yeah, insulin, uh, metformin, these medications are uh, great medications for emergent situations. You can commoditize it and they're scientifically backed. But really the true like um, success story would be prescribing the person exercise as a preventative medicine uh, in, in the first place when they're in the stage of pre-diabetes, meaning that their blood sugars were high but they didn't have full-blown diabetes yet. And that is like the, the great preventative medicine treatment is diet and exercise. But because diet and exercise, you can't commoditize it as easy and it's not good in those emergency situations when things have gotten so bad that like, think about it, when a person's leg is falling off from diabetes, you can't exactly just tell them to exercise more at that point. It would have been great two years ago before they got to that stage, but now we're in this emergency situation and they need the insulin, they need the surgery, they need those other uh, very uh, vetted Western medicine techniques to actually save their lives, okay? So where am I going with all this? When it comes to neurofeedback and meditation, neurofeedback and meditation are really within the realm of diet and exercise would be, okay? So uh, there's plenty of scientific evidence behind meditation, for example. Uh, I'm gonna plug, again, Daniel Goleman and Richard Davidson's book, Altered Traits, showing all this research they've done over the last 30 years of showing how meditation completely alters the architecture of your brain. It improves things like um, uh, pain tolerance, uh, emotional resiliency. It improves things like uh, relaxation response in your body. You know, we have studies from Harvard showing that meditation actually expresses genes within your metabolic and immunological systems to improve the, the health of your body, just like exercise does. You know, these are incredible, important things that you can be doing with your life, but Western medicine is not going to call it mainstream medicine because it doesn't meet those criteria of being good in emergency situations and being commoditized uh, financially in the way that um, a medication could be. And there's really good evidence for neurofeedback when it comes to randomized control trials and uh, meta-analysis that I'll put in the, the link of this video, just showing the evidence for attention training for ADHD or anxiety training for people with uh, anxiety. Um, you know, the, the evidence continues to mount. And some, to be honest, some people get in trouble for saying specifically that neurofeedback will treat ADHD, even though it does, because uh, not enough money has been incorporated into generating the scientific evidence for the FDA to be like, okay, it's a vetted, true, awesome treatment, no question about it. But in other countries, it becomes so like widespread. Like in Germany, when I spoke to Brain Boost a couple of months ago, uh, you can see that video in, in at Tech for Psych channel. You know, they give money for companies to engage in these types of treatments and neurofeedback is covered because there's enough evidence for the German government to support it. And here's my hope. As our technology improves, as things like the Muse headband, um, another device like Oblabs, functional infrared spectroscopy device that I'm going to be um, meeting up with here soon within a month or two. You know, as these technologies improve, as they become more democratized, as they spread, and more people have access to them, and more providers can prove that the treatments that they've do been doing with people are actually scientifically sound, because we have more objective evidence and taking a look at the myelination of the brain, or the blood level uh, activation patterns of the brain, we can show and prove that these treatments are really, really helping people. And then, you know, mainstream medicine will get their greedy hands on it and like bring that more into the fold. Before big research institutions will devote their precious resources into designing randomized control trials, which are very difficult to run, take a lot of money to run, us, we need to be laying the groundwork and showing that these treatments can be very powerful and effective in people's lives so that other people get interested and it actually, that's really my, my vision for Tech for Psych and this neurotechnology and where I see uh, neurofeedback technology and meditation falling into like the realm of traditional medicine in America, in the world. So 
I got some music playing in the background here. It sounds like they're getting ready for a party in the park. So I'm gonna sign off here, but I don't want you to stop here. I want you to go to this video right here where I review Daniel Goleman and Richard Davidson's work on meditation and the evidence and biological standards that they've accumulated over time. So go to this video right here and enjoy. Thanks so much.